So welcome everybody um, to the Cork Nature Network um, webinar. Um, and tonight we have a, a wonderful talk from Hugh Vili on stoneflies. Um, and just before we kick off um, Hugh's presentation, I just want to um, give you a quick um, background in terms of Cork Nature Network and what we do for anybody who's not familiar with our work. Um, my name is John O'Sullivan. I'm one of the volunteers um, of Cork Nature Network. Um, and Cork Nature Network is um, a, an organization that aims to benefit the community of Ireland by promoting and encouraging the conservation of wildlife and habitats by educating, educating and increasing the awareness of the need of conservation in Ireland. Um, we have many projects running um, around Cork at the moment, um, um, specifically the Bowman Quarry um, Conservation Quarry, the um, Cork Otters Project, the Wild Spaces Project, and the Valuing Insects Project. Um, this webinar tonight is um, specifically part of the Valuing Insects Project, a project where we're looking to increase awareness of um, insects um, and not just their, their uses, but their value, their intrinsic value as um, organisms on the planet. Um, in terms of Cork Nature Network, we if you enjoy the webinar tonight, we would encourage you to, um, to um, support us. And this can be done by becoming a member of Cork Nature Network, um, which has um, a number of benefits, such as an um, biannual newsletter, membership, membership um, certificate, um, access to web members only webinars, and 20% off field studies um, council courses. Um, the the 12 month membership is um, tenure for um, ordinary membership, five euro for a concession and 20 euro for um, family. You're also, if if you don't wish to become a member, but if you do want to support us, you can feel free to donate. Um, so on that, I'd just like to introduce um, Hugh Feeney. Hugh is one of Ireland's um, leading freshwater um, ecologists and um, has a specific interest in freshwater insect insects, specifically um, stoneflies and mainflies. Um, he currently is working for the EPA and he's also co-authored um, a new key to British and Irish stoneflies, which was published in 2022 um, and is the first new key to this insect group in the last 60 years. Um, so. Without further ado, I'll hand you over to Hugh. Hugh, welcome. So thanks everyone. Um, so uh, thanks John for the introduction. Um, I'd just like to say, uh, as John mentioned there, I do work for the Environmental Protection Agency, but uh, today I'm here in a personal capacity. So just in case <laughs> anything is, uh, I'm not, I'm speaking in a personal capacity. Um, the next talk, the next few uh, slides hopefully uh, will give you something uh, to take home about stoneflies in Ireland and hopefully this will last about 30 to 40 minutes um, and we can have a bit of a Q&A at the end. Uh, so stoneflies, what are they? So they're an order of insects um, and the order's name scientifically is the Plecoptera. So you'll often, you might hear me interchange between stonefly and Plecoptera. Um, uh, they're the same thing. Uh, they're about 200 million years old. So the first records of stoneflies come from the Permian period. Um, and there's in the top right hand corner there, you can see it, there's a fossil stonefly from, I can't remember where it's from, but it's about 200 million years old. Um, and you also get in the bottom right hand corner there, there's some stonefly and they, you tend to find them, they get caught in amber, uh, you know, as they rest on trees and amber comes down. So that's fossilized amber. That's about, a, that's from the Cretaceous, I think from, uh, from Indonesia. So um, they are quite an old, and, and as you can see, uh, the two pictures on the left and then the picture on the bottom right, they, they don't, they haven't really changed a whole lot. And since the Cretaceous period, when the dinosaurs were around, they still have the same shape, the same body plan, the same, um, number of wings, the same style of wings, same venation, everything. So they, they are along around a long time and they haven't changed a whole lot. So worldwide there's about three and a half thousand species. Now this is increasing all the time as, as people, uh, venture into more tropical areas and, and parts of the world that previously might not have been uh, as well researched. In Europe, we've approximately 570. Again, I, I can only say approximately because there's constantly changes in chopping and, and insects being split out where they thought there was one group might be two or three, you know, as especially now as genetics becomes more and more um, used as a tool. Um, and just to compare the British and Irish Isles, then in Britain, there's about 35 species. And on the island of Ireland, we have 20. And I'll discuss that 20 a bit more uh, later on. Um, and just to mention that 
this group uh, is exclusively found in fresh waters. So there's no terrestrial or, or marine um, phase or, or um, species. They're all found in our rivers and lakes and, and, and similar freshwater areas. So stoneflies kind of continuing on that theme where are they found. So they're predominantly found in, in rivers and lakes um, and they're extremely abundant in upland rivers and upland lakes and waved washed, uh, sorry, upland uh, rivers, uh, so turbulent rivers. Um, uh, not necessarily small rivers, but generally fast flowing, um, loose substrate, that kind of thing. And then on lakes, you'll find them in wave wash shorelines with stony substrate along the uh, the bank. Um, two examples there, Loch Arrow and Loch Beltra. Um, and they can be quite uh, they can be quite dominant in these areas. So I think you can get up to 30, 40, 50 percent of the community can be stoneflies in these areas. Um, and then as you move down the system from higher altitude towards the lower uh, reaches of rivers, they tend to drop off in numbers. Uh, you'll still get them um, in the lower reaches of rivers and, um, and in lakes at, at uh, in different in other types of lakes as well, but maybe uh, less of less of them. Um, they do also occur in canals, turlocks, ponds, reservoirs. If you have fresh water and uh, you you, 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 you may have stoneflies. Now, not all fresh waters will have stoneflies, and I'll probably go into that a little bit uh, later on. Um, but, you know, there are groups like the Nemuridae, uh, which can be found, uh, even you'll find them in the burn and very cast calcareous uh, waters where you won't find a lot of other, a lot of other insect life. So how many species do we have? So I mentioned earlier, we have 20. Uh, so we have uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, um, seven, seven families. You think I'd know that at this stage, but we have seven families, the Capnidae, the Chloroperlidae, the Leuctridae, the Perlidae, the Neuridae, uh, the Perlodidae, and the Teneopteridae. And you'll see then there's a very, there's varying number of species um, within each family. Um, and, uh, you know, I won't go into the detail of, of where and how rare and how common some of these species are, but generally you'll find them across the country. Um, of those 20 species, we actually only have 19 present in Ireland. So Perlodes mortoni, uh, which is one of the Perlodidae, and that is deemed now extinct in Ireland. Um, and I'll mention that a little bit again later on. So you'll often hear stoneflies people mention oh we've got 20 species so that's what we knew we had but in, in reality we only have 19 species so endemism and stonefly so endemism basically is um you know species that are unique to ireland and not found anywhere else now we don't have any species particularly unique to ireland but we do have some species that are unique to britain and ireland uh, so that means they're different you know being different from the rest of europe the, the first one being Perlos Martoni. Um, so it's it's originally been endemic in Britain and Ireland. Um, we have records of it from the Dina River in County Kerry and the Glyde River in Louth from in the nine, uh, late 1800s and early 1900s. Uh, unfortunately, now it's considered extinct in Ireland, so we've never found we have found no records of it since um, 1901. Um, but it's still very common in Britain. And um, I just threw in a photograph there from Craig. Look colleague of mine in Scotland. So if you're ever to come across a little uh, um, larvae with a very uh, particular patterned head there, you can see um, that would be worth noting, but um, always take a photograph. You never know what you might find. Uh, and we do have records. So the top right hand corner there, you'll see Castle Bellingham written underneath it. So that's actually the, the 1901 specimen that was found uh, and it's in the Natural History Museum in Dublin. Uh, so we do know we did have it. Uh, the other endemic species we have, which hasn't been announced yet, but uh, I'm talking to Swiss colleagues who've done a review of uh, the Perlidae in Europe. Um, so our we have a species called Perlabog punctata, and Perlabog punctata used to have um, quite a distribution across from Ireland all the way across to Eastern Europe and from Northern Denmark all the way down to Morocco and Southern Spain. But uh, in reality now, um, they've done a few more taxonomic checks. They've checked a few more things across um, various things. And what we have in Ireland uh, is, is deemed very much different. Uh, so this is going to be called, probably from January, February next year, this will revert to the name Car Perla Carlucciana. Carlucciana being the place it was originally found in Scotland back in uh, the late 1800s. Um, and again, it'll be endemic to Britain and Ireland, and it's very common in Ireland, especially in the south and southwest. So 
was just saying to John earlier on, so the Salan River in Macroom um, and and its tributaries, as you go back towards Bal um, uh, Ballyvorney, they would it would have quite a lot of uh, this Perla Carlucciana in them. Uh, so it it's uh, it's nice to see we have something unique in Ireland. Um, so just to talk about the life cycle of stoneflies, so there there's a few scientific words here in terms of uh, their hemimetabolis. And basically all that means is they give a complete me a metamorphosis. So unlike butterflies and caddisflies, they don't have a pupil stage. So you'll see here in the bottom kind of sketch, you have the larvae on the right and we have the adult on the left with the wings. And they're pretty much exactly the same. The only difference being that one has wings and one doesn't. The larval form is always found in water, whereas the adult is always found in la on land, as in tr it's always terrestrial. Uh, but it it'll always be found along river banks. Um, you know, occasionally they might you might see one in your sitting room or on a wall somewhere, but in general they don't venture too far from the rivers. But they go through this phase where they have uh, an egg, uh, and the egg stage can last anywhere from a few hours all the way to to a year, depending on on the conditions and and the species. And then they have this larval stage again. It's pretty much reflects what the adult looks like without wings. And you'll see there's gills in the photograph there. So some of them will have gills that are quite evident, and they use these for breathing underwater and this is the longest phase of the of the uh of the insect's life and again it can last anywhere from three four months right up to three four years depending on on uh, the species and then the adult phase is the last phase and this is the re obviously the phase for reproduction so they emerge from the rivers or lakes or canals or wherever they are and they breed as adults and then they lay their eggs back in the water and adults generally don't live that long um there are some studies that suggest they live, some can live for up to a month. Um, they're those species that feed, but a lot of the larger species actually don't have mouth parts. They don't feed, so they only last a few days. So they basically hatch, they reproduce, they die, and the cycle begins again. <clears throat> so in terms of the eggs, um, not to go into too much detail, but it, it, even the eggs are unique to each species. And you see the top right-hand corner here, there's a photograph from a colleague uh, from Slovakia. And this is the egg of Perla carlucciana, which we were talking. Oh, sorry, which we were talking about earlier. Um, um, and each egg will have a different shape. It'll have different patterns, different connections. Uh, so they can be identified using their eggs. Uh, females, the bottom left-hand corner, you'll see uh, uh, the uh, the Perla there with uh, a clutch of eggs on her abdomen. Um, and you can have anywhere between a hundred right up to several thousand eggs. So each little black dot here is an individual egg. Um, uh, and then the graph in the middle is just to highlight, this is a study done by uh, John Malcolm Elliott uh, in the UK, and um, we have temperature along the bottom here, and you can see how their, their eggs are very reliant on temperature and very reliant on low temperatures. So again, this might become a bit more um, relevant as we move into the future with climate. Um, so the little dot in the middle of each of these graphs is the optimum temperature. And you'll see here, once you start to go above 10 degrees, um they they don't like it so the eggs um need to have water temperatures of 10 degrees or less to develop and at the moment thankfully that's probably okay but as we move into the future that might become more of a challenge so the larval stage so the larvae of um <clears throat> they can come in various sizes and various shapes um uh various features and various shapes but in general they have the same insect body plan you know they have a head thorax uh, abdomen they have six legs some will have gills, some won't, um, uh, but they generally find they follow the same pattern. They have, you know, generally, if you go to citizen science um, a study or anything like that, generally they say, you know, look out for the insect with two la uh, two tails. Um, so that's often a good uh, way of distinguishing them from mayflies. Um, there are some other insect groups with two tails, so it does catch people out occasionally, but it is a reasonable indicator to use. Um, again, they can range anywhere from four millimeters right up to 33, 34 millimeters. So the you know the length of your thumb. Um, and again, they all when they all hatch, they're all tiny, um, and then they grow over their respective period. Um, again, as I said, so some of these species, so Leuctra fusca would last maybe would take about two months during the summer when temperatures are quite warm to become an adult. Whereas uh, Perla bipunctata or Perla cuculiana and Dianacrasophilus, the two big uh, Perlidae, they live for a minimum of three years as a larvae before they hatch as an adult. And they, under certain conditions, they might even last a bit longer, maybe four or five years. 
Um, most of the larvae are found from autumn through to spring and early summer. So you're talking from October through to May. Um, now you will get species that will occur in June and July as well, depending on the year. Um, but that's when most of the stoneflies. So the best time is really to look for stoneflies is probably April, May every year. Uh, there are some species that are best looked for in, in February, March, but in general, you're talking April, May. Uh, we've got one species, Leuctra fusca, that's um, found then only in summertime. And the adults are on the wing at the moment. So if I get any records of stone, of Leuctra from November, I know that's Leuctra fusca is the only one. Um, and then you have the larger stoneflies. So the stoneflies that live for multiple years, they will occur all year round. Um, and they can be quite good because if you find them uh, and they have multiple age classes. So what I mean by that is you might have a group that are one size, a group that are double that size and then a group that are triple that size and then you know that that insect has been there for three years and happily living for the last three years. Um, so in terms of larval development, um, so like all insects, they have to to shed their skin to grow their exoskeleton. Um, so you'll often see, so this is the top left hand corner, this is Perla carlucchiana, Perla bipunctata, um, and it's very pale. And the bottom left hand corner again, we've Diura di di caudata, which is almost yellowy and see-through. So this is when they've just shed their exoskeleton um, and they're waiting to harden up. So this is quite a vulnerable stage of the larval development and they can be quite um, vulnerable to predation at this stage because they're nice and soft. But then as they mature, so the photograph on the top right, then you'll see that they darken and they uh, they uh, they go on about their business. Um, other elements of larval development. So if you look at the top right hand corner and, and the middle photograph on the bottom, you'll see the wing pads. So you'll start to see so this happens late as they go towards maturity. So if you pick up in these insects in, in um, April and May, you'll often see that their wing pads are beginning to grow. And that's where they're basically getting ready to become adults. Um, and the, if you, even if you catch one of these and, and it's dead or something, if you slice open the wing pad, you can almost fold out the wing um, that it would have produced as an adult. And then the bottom right hand corner, the Numeral Epicuti, um, you'll see there's kind of two little forks at the end of the abdomen. So even in the uh, in larval stages, if you get them late on, so I can tell this is straight away, this is going to be a male. So the two little pincers at the end is, a, is, is, is the male reproductive parts developing. Uh, in the late stage larval. So so often you can tell a lot from the from the larvae, especially late on. So the next stage, and this is almost the, the most uh you know, um I suppose what would you say the for the life cycle in terms of survival, this can be quite a dangerous phase because it, it can it can a lot can go wrong. But uh the larvae basically crawls out of the river or crawls out of the lake onto the bank and onto the side of the wall or the bridge wall or wherever, and it splits its exoskeleton and it starts to pull itself out. So you'll see in, in the photograph, second and third and fourth photograph, you'll see the adult pulling itself out of the larval cuticle or the larval skin um, to become an adult. And then you'll see that in the fourth photograph on the right, the wings are all folded up um, and crushed. So that's not crushed, but just not pumped out so they'll they'll spend some time just after they emerge then pumping those wings up so that they can they can use them um and you'll often come across this on the side of a bank so this is the upper river liffey from june a few years ago and there's hundreds of these um exuvia as they're called but basically it's the skins left over from the larvae and they've where they've literally crawled out of the river attached themselves to a rock and the adult has pulled itself out of the the skin and these can often be uh a good indicator that there's adults about, um, but also I can identify the species. So some of the species can be identified from the larval cuticle um, because it's basically the larvae without anything in it. Um, so if you ever come across these, you can always take a photograph or collect them um, and they can be ID'd. Um, and you can see here in the top left hand corner, you see that split more clearly where you know the adult has pulled itself out of. And interestingly, um, the 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 these these larvae, uh, they're only some of these uh, species are only 10, 12 millimeters, so a centimeter long. So an example here is Iceberg grammatica on the right hand side. So this is a stalactite that's six meters above the river on a bridge. So this insect has climbed, has come out during the night and traveled six meters, <laughs> which I don't know what that's like for a, a ten, a one centimeter long insect, all the way up to the stalactite to emerge as an adult. Uh, why did they do this? We don't know because they could easily just 
literally pull themselves out um, once they've left the water. Um, but this is quite a common thing. So don't look along the water's edge. Often, if you've come across a bridge, look along the top of the bridge, the roof of the bridge, the high up on the walls of the bridge, and you might see them. Um, the other thing here, I have a little video to the left, and I know the sound isn't playing, but the the I won't play the video, but it's actually a video I came across of a larvae crawling across a, a rock in County Wicklow in the Ow River um, in the middle of the day, which is really unusual. So a lot of the time this happens at night when there's less, you know, they're less likely to be seen by predators. But this was in the middle of the day, just crawling across a rock. Um, so then when you come across the adults, um, they'll look very much like the 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 larvae, but they'll uh, obviously have wings. And when they first emerge, you'll see that they're this kind of yellowy soft color. And that's kind of similar to what the what I mentioned about the larvae and the cuticles. So they're, they're quite soft. And then you'll see the photograph just this is the same insect, uh, the two photographs on the left, top and bottom. And one is just a few hours later where it's finally hardened. Uh, and you can see how dark it is in comparison to when it's first emerged. Um, so that's just something, again, if you ever come across them, it's, 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 uh, it's something to note. Um, Again, they've a range in various sizes, all the way from four or five millimeters right up to 30 millimeters. The adults are always slightly smaller than the largest larvae because the adult has to come out of the largest larvae. So that's, you know, the assumption is always that the adult will always be the biggest step stage of the, the life cycle. But actually the, 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 uh, the last instar of a, a larvae is the, the largest. And then the adult is slightly smaller. Um, again, they last from days to week, depending on the species. Um, and generally you'll find them from spring right through to autumn, but spring is probably the best. Spring and early summer is the best time to look for them. Um, just some notes on on some of the adults. Um, the sexual dimorphism. So basically, what we mean by this is differences between males and females. So the larvae tend to be quite difficult to separate um, into males and females. Some of them can be. Uh, there is little indicators, and in the late stage larval stage, sometimes you can, as I mentioned earlier. But in, gen in general, the larvae cannot be separated into males and females, but the adults can. Um, and a lot of the time, the females are much, much bigger than the males. So an example on the right here is Diora dicotata from Van de Locke in Wicklow. And you see the male on the right and the female, and the female is almost three times the size of, of the male. Um, but then on the bottom left-hand side, the same species from Loch Conn and Mayo, um, the male is only slightly smaller than the female. So you do get this variation even within species. Um, and a lot of this reason is obviously the females have to carry the eggs. So they put a lot of energy into being bigger, whereas the males don't have to get that big. They just need to be able to survive to be able to get out and reproduce. Um, and you often see this is not, this is quite common across a lot of insect uh, groups. Um, another thing that's quite unusual in stoneflies, you get this thing called wing polymorphism. And basically what we mean there is you get variations in wings. So stoneflies in general don't like flying. I know that kind of sounds stupid when I say that because they produce these wings. They put a lot of effort into producing these wings. But there are, I rarely ever see stoneflies flying. Um, they they just like to run around. There are certain species like the Chloroperlidae that will fly quite regularly, but a lot of them don't fly. Um, and the the an example here on the top right hand corner, we've Diura bicorata again from Loch Mask, and you'll see how small the wings are. So they're basically just there. You know, they don't even need that. They can't even use them if they wanted to. Um, so these would uh, these would be called um, Machiaptrus rings. The bottom right hand corner then is uh, so it's a sorry. I ha I need to update this photograph. I have a better one, but it's as Vicnia bifrost, and this is not the larval stage. This is the adult stage. And you do well to even spot the wings on, on, um, on this, on the species when you find them. And the, the funny thing about both these species on the right is the wing females are fully winged, but they still don't fly e either. So there seems to be, um, this kind of strange scenario where females produce large wings, but don't really use them. And the males then don't tend to bother producing wings. Uh, then the bottom two photographs is just another Superlis so mortani, which is our, the extinct species. So that's just to show the difference between the male and the female. So you see the female with on the right hand side there, the bottom, big, big, uh, well veined, quite clear wings. And then on the right, the male uh, with little or no wings. Now, there's a lot of theories relating to this. So, you know, males just need to be able to find a female once and reproduce and that's their job done. Whereas females kind of might have to fly around or they, 
they might have to 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 use to fly back to the water if they if they get blown um, away from the river. Um, so there are some theories around why the females put a lot of effort into their wing production, the males don't. Um, but again, it's all it's all it's 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 still all theory at the moment. Um, so just a brief note on reproduction. So like all um, like all species, you need a male and a female to reproduce. Um, and you'll often come across them if you get them at the peak of their uh, emergence periods. You get the males sit, uh, sitting on top of the females, almost protecting them. So once they once they mate, they tend to kind of do this mate guarding so that no other male can come in and 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 reproduce as well, uh, or can mate with the female. Um, so no more than anyone protecting their own their own patch, I suppose. Once they once they've reproduced, and then you'll see the the females produce these egg clutches. So the bottom right hand corner, you'll see a, a picture of two females uh, that have produced egg clutches, um, and you'll often see them sitting on vegetation, waiting for it to get dark with their eggs, fertilized eggs, at the end of the abdomen, um, and then they'll fly across the water or they'll run across the water and just dip their abdomen in the water, and the eggs kind of fall. Um, haphazard, haphazardly uh, to the bottom of the river or the lake. Um, so again, the, this is a video I have. I, I know uh, we tested it on the sound is not playing, but uh, males and females are able to locate each other using a unique thing called drumming. So only stoneflies do this. Um, and although you can't hear the sound, so it's it's kind of a drum. It's a real kind of beat. And each species, the beat will be um, unique to that species. But if you look at the the central photograph here and the the little insect that's zoomed in and kind of blurry, if you watch the tip of its abdomen there, you'll s hopefully see it flicking off the off the petri dish. Um, so that's creating a, a pattern beat, and the female then will re will re re reply to that beat, and they are able to locate each other. So as they get closer, they beat quicker, and then eventually they find each other and reproduce. Now, again, we've discussed this with colleagues across Europe, but how they can hear this beat over the sound of the river or the waves washing on a lake, we don't know. Um, but they do use it, and there's lots of studies to show that um, if you put two different species in petri dishes and they start drumming, they don't, they ignore each other. Put two of the same species in, and they'll start gravitating, you know, they'll start trying to find each other and, and to reproduce. Um, males will drum continuously. So even once they've mated, like all males, they'll be opportunistic and they'll keep drumming, hoping another female will come along. But the females, once females have mated, they tend not to drum again. So you'll often, if you ever find uh, some stoneflies and you want to test this out, put them in some petri dishes. Uh, so if you don't put an individual, don't put them all in one petri dish, so they'll just climb all over each other. But um, you, you can often hear the drum. But if the female doesn't drum, it's probably because she's already mated. Um, but so it can often be a trial and error uh, approach, but um, it's it's quite interesting if you ever get a chance. So I suppose kind of moving on then, how to find stoneflies. Um, so if I start on the left and I move to the right in terms of the photographs, so there's a picture of me there in Glendalock, and then there's one from me in in the uh, in the Upper Liffey, or is it the I think it's or maybe it's the Analeka in the Upper King's Catchment, taking kick samples. So the best way to take a to find larvae is to take a kick sample. So get your kick net, go out to your local river, your lake shore, uh, disturb the sediment and the substrate, and 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 then in the middle top photograph, put it into a white tray. Uh, clean all the vegetation out and then start looking for your insects. And then in the bottom middle photograph, you'll see two of the uh, larger perlidae um, with their two tails and their and their quite distinctive patterns. And then alongside some Rithrogena mayfly there in the tray. So you'll see them in the tray. That's the easiest way to see the larvae. And it's also the best way to find stonefly um, because the adults tend to be quite hit and miss. Um, and, um, and they can only, if the, even if they're only out for two weeks, you might just miss them. Whereas the larvae, if they're there, They'll be generally there all the way from October through to to May, April, May. Um, on the top right then is another photograph of of basically where I've just turned a boulder in a river, and you'll see the little stonefly sitting on the on the on the stone. Um, and then on the bottom right hand corner, you'll often see, especially where there's a bit of de deciduous um, trees along a river, you see a little patch of um, leaf litter like that uh, found against the stone. If you put your kick net just downstream of that and, and break it up with your hand, 
the stonefly, a lot of the stoneflies, they're they're shredders, so they feed on this leaf material, and they'll you know they'll wash into your net, um. So you're able to find them that way. Um, it's quite quite an easy way of doing it. Uh, obviously that only really works at this time of the year, but often in summertime too, it can work if there's if there's bits of vegetation in the river. Uh, this is just a video. So this is a, co a friend of mine in UCD who took this video uh, on uh, on finding stoneflies. So this is basically where he's turning some stones in stream and see if you can spot the stonefly when you come across it. So that's one of the larger species. That's our Perla carlukiana or Perla bipunctata, depending on which name we're using for the moment. Um, and obviously it's quite large there and when you, you see it turn the stone. But um, if you do that, a lot of the time you will find, uh, you might even find fattened mayflies, the Actinura day, uh, uh, the Heptagena day as well. Um, so it's, it's quite a good way of finding insects. You don't necessarily have to fill them up. But if you lifted that stone out of the water and turned it, uh, you'd see the insect uh, quite easily or the insects. So how to find adults. So again, um, adults will be a bit harder to find because they'll only be around for certain types of the year. So you'll see here in the photographs on the right um, where there's reeds and grass, they'll often just be sitting uh, on the tips of the on the tips of the grass. Um, and this is often a case of just getting your eye in. So you'd often go up to uh, reeds or vegetation along the a shoreline of a lake, especially um, and if you sit there long enough and get your eye in, you'll begin to see them and they'll just be sitting there um, um, uh, in the vegetation. Um, another good place is to see them is if there's any fence posts. So there's a great study done in the UK where they found that fence posts tend to be four or five degrees warmer than the surrounding uh, environment. It's to do with the way the sun and all. I, it's, there's quite a lot of physics involved. But they'll often sit, so you'll see here the little in, at the bottom right hand corner here, uh, insects just, stoneflies just sitting on the tops of these um, fence posts and they're, they'll often be reproducing there or just sitting there um, uh, and it's almost like they're just sunbathing where they can get a bit of energy um, to, to before they go off uh, looking for a mate. Uh, and then the bottom uh, on the right hand side then the Nilo Hagen uh, photograph is just in amongst the vegetation. So if you have a, if you're, if you like beating vegetation with, um, uh, you know, that along riverbanks, putting a white tray underneath some vegetation and just beating it or knocking it with your hand often knocks them out of the uh, vegetation into the tray. Um, and that's a good way of finding it. And then I have a video here. Again, you won't be able to hear the sound, but uh, this is how I find adult perla on in the in the Liffey. Um, and this is all the stones along the let on the the bank of the river. And it's just a case of turning stones. And you'll have to turn a stone, and you'll see it. Um, again, this is quite a large species, so it's quite obvious when you see it. But they'll they never stop running. <laughs> um, and you kind of just it can be a, a good way of finding them. Um, sorry. Um, so yeah, they can. But again, unless you go there at the right time of the year, um, you're unlikely to to see that. Uh, but again, if you go along that to a river you're used to going to, and you see the exuvia along the stones, if you start turning the stones along the bank, you'll you'll find them. Uh, definitely, it's um, because generally the exuvia. They get washed out when floods happen. So if the exuvia are there, they tend to the adults tend to be uh, there as well. So it's a good good way of looking at it. Uh, so just a brief comment on stoneflies in the environment, and I suppose you know why are they important, or you know, not may, one of the main reasons obviously is they they're quite a substantial uh, proportion of our insects in the rivers, but they provide food for our fish and our birds. So salmon, trout, uh, dippers, they all uh, feed on on stoneflies and mayflies and trichoptera and all but in in the uplands especially stonefly being one excuse me one of the main groups they they can perform quite a proportion high proportion of the diet um they're also uh 
the adults can be quite significant in terms of terrestrial invertebrates. Um, so the top right-hand corner here is a picture from Connemara I had a few years ago where there's red ants and they're, the red ants are basically hunting in amongst the stones for, for adult stoneflies. And you can see here one where it's grabbed it and it's in the process of killing it to drag it back to its its nest. And then in the bottom right-hand corner, we have a species Isoperigomatica and you'll often come across, if you come across a bridge sill, one of the best places to look often is uh, spider's webs because they get caught in the spider's webs. And even sometimes when they've been fed on the the external um, uh, the external body parts of the insect are, are still intact. So you can take it out and you can bring it back and you can identify it. Um, but again, at certain times of the year, these would, they would provide substantial food to the, to the, to insects, uh, and, and spiders. Um, the, in, uh, I, I mentioned nutrient cycling and breaking down leaves. So in a lot of our rivers and our lake shores, where there's a lot of deciduous woodland and deciduous trees, uh, stoneflies are one of the main groups that break these, uh, uh, leaves down into smaller material and so this is just re recycling the nutrients back into the environment um, and then obviously when they get fed on by other insects and fish and the, the you know the whole nutrient cycling of that system is it stays in place um, they're quite a pollution sensitive group so what i mean by that is if you've low oxygen or high levels of nutrient pollution um, you tend not to get stoneflies or you tend to get less of them and that's why they're very common in our uplands um, because a lot of our uplands are not polluted at the moment. Um, whereas as we go down into the uh, larger, uh, lower reaches of rivers where there's more pressures on our rivers, you tend to get less stoneflies, um, sometimes because of pollution, other times because of, 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 of life cycle um, and where they like to live. But pollution, if there's pollution there, you won't get, you generally don't get stoneflies. Um, but in high, but in in parallel to that, they're quite tolerant of low pH, so acidic rivers, um, and they can often be the dominant groups in acid rivers. So if you go to uh, upland rivers that drain peat and might naturally have lower pH, they're often uh, full of stoneflies, and stoneflies happily uh, live there. Um, whereas other groups like the mayflies and 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 caddisflies might um, can tend to be quite variable and 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 less common in the, those kind of waters. Um, and because of this, because they're sensitive then to pollution and because they're uh, indicators of, of low pH, we often use, in, in my day-to-day -day work in, in the Environment Protection Agency, we would use them as indicators. So generally, finding stoneflies is good. Um, you, you know, it, it's indicative of, of good quality waters. Um, so threats to stoneflies in Ireland. This, again, I could spend a whole talk, just a, a whole seminar just talking about threats to stoneflies in Ireland, but in general, it's pollution. So excess nutrients coming from practices like agriculture or wastewater treatment or um, other uh, similar type um, pollution um, points. Uh, and then again, this is mainly driven, not necessarily by the nutrients themselves, but generally because you get a lot of plant and algal growth and that depresses the oxygen and, not, and stoneflies need a lot of oxygen in stream. And without uh, oxygen, they just die out. Um, siltation, so what I mean by siltation is really fine sediment that's not naturally there. So you get this a lot of the time from maybe um, erosion or, um, you know, where where you might have livestock uh, uh, breaking down riverbanks or similar. Um, and a lot of that, again, is that stone, this, the sediment, the silt doesn't necessarily affect the stonefly itself. But what it does, it fills in all the gaps amongst the stones where the stoneflies live and hunt and feed. And then they just have nowhere to live, so they begin to die out. Um, habitat loss. So again, you know, if you get a river or a lake and there's changes, whether, you know, someone puts in a concrete wall or changes a big bridge or, or changes the root of the river or changes the, the substrate or, you know, any of that kind of stuff that that will uh, affect stoneflies. Um, again, land use change. So this is more reflecting. So I said earlier, like stoneflies tend to be found in the uplands. And at the moment, our uplands tend to be quite, you know, um, there tends to be some some agriculture, but it tends to be quite a low intensity. But as as we move into the future and 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 some of these practices uh, are changing, and land is getting more and more um, used for for growing, uh, you know, whether it's growing crops or or having cows or growing trees or whatever it is, um, that can can have an influence on on the river. Um, affecting habitat loss or siltation or pollution. Uh, so the kind of land use change is kind of a catch all for, for some of the threats. Um, again, the loss of our high status waters. So, you know, a lot of our, our, our rivers and, and lakes that would have been 
relatively clean through the 70s and 80s um, are now beginning to decline for very lots of different various reasons. But again, these are strongholds for stoneflies, especially the larger, longer lived ones. And as we as these begin to decline, these stone these species will 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 begin to decline as well. And as I mentioned earlier on, stoneflies are quite sensitive to low temperatures. Um, they need low temperatures to grow. Um, and as we get these warming uh, waters, what what's going to happen is they're going to start wanting to get higher and higher and higher in altitude to grow and to live. And eventually they're going to run out of space. There isn't going to be places high enough for them to live. Um, a good example is so we have Capnia atra, which is a species we find along the West Coast. Um, and that's considered vulnerable now to climate change based on the fact that it needs very cold water to survive. Um, and again, I'm nearly finished. So there's... Uh, just to briefly mention our record, so I suppose the history of, of stonefly and recording of stonefly in Ireland. So our first records are from the 1960s and, uh, and 19, or sorry, 19, 1860s and 1880s from Alexander Halliday and, and James King, um, who, uh, who first started to record these taxa. Um, our national data set, which is held on the National Biodiversity Data Center, uh, our records cover from 1887 right up to 2003. So there's 136 years worth of data. We've over 13,000 records. And the map there in the middle kind of just shows the distribution of the dots. Um, of I know when you look at the National Biodiversity Data Center, I think it does it on a 10, 10K square. Um, but you'll see there's lots of gaps in the country. And, and these are not necessarily gaps where there's no stoneflies. These are just gaps maybe where there hasn't been records submitted. Um, so, you know, if you're, if you're uh, especially in the Midlands or up in the north, um, there's always chances to add more stonefly records to to the national data set. And if anyone's really interested, uh, myself and my colleague Craig in Scotland uh, produced a paper, uh, a history paper. I, I've done lots of scientific papers. This is the first history paper. Uh, we did a history paper on the discovery of stonefly in Britain and Ireland. Um, and if anyone wants that, just drop me an email or, or get in touch and I'll happily send it on. Now it is, it's quite academic, but it's not, it's not too bad. Um, but if you're interested in that kind of thing. Uh, and because this is the Cork um, Nature Network, I said I better talk about Cork. So um, we have over 1,300 records for Cork now in the national data set. Um, you'll see all the dots there. These are all the records we have. Uh, I was just talking to John there prior to this, and he was telling me this, that he, has, he knows this stonefly in Cork City. We've no stonefly records for Cork City in the national data set. So get them in. If next, So the easiest way to do that is take a photograph or collect a specimen and send it on to me and uh, and that will become a record. Um, but it, again, this this is just a highlight. This is Cork, but it's it's pretty, it reflects all counties in the country. Like our, our river network is quite extensive um, and there's always areas where we don't have records. So even when you think, oh, someone might have put this record in before, always put the record in because it might be the first record for that river or for that tributary or for that um, lake or whatever it be. Um, and just to mention there, Cork, Cork has 18 of the 19 species that we know from Ireland. And I say it probably might even have the 19. So Protomoria precox there, which is in yellow. There is a tentative record of that from uh, a kind of, just north of McCroom from the 1980s, but we haven't been able to verify it. So it's not in the records. So there might be all 19 species in, in Cork after all. So if you're out in a river near McCroom in next um, February, March, see what in, see what stone flies around. You might have a new new record for Cork uh, or a, at least a confirmed record for Cork. But again, a lot of like Galway, Mayo, Kerry, a lot of Donegal, a lot of the counties along the west coast and southwest coast would have um, most of the species. But no county in Ireland has all 19, even though I think Kerry now might have, where I have to confirm. I have a load of tubes I need to, to go through just yet. Uh, so we might have proto New York Precox in, in Kerry now, which would round out Kerry. But it's just to show you that even after 136 years of, of, of records, um, and 13,000 records in, in the data set, we're, we're still learning, we're still finding new stuff, and we're still, we're still um, uh, adding to the, to the science. Um, so just some further information. So these are some links. I can uh, always get these circulated again afterwards. Um, so if you go on the National Biodiversity Data Center and search data sets 225, you'll get the Stonefly data set, which you can download and look at yourself. Um, if you go on the National Biodiversity Data Center, there's a free PDF, the Stonefly Plecopter of Ireland, so the book there in the bottom left. So that's a book we published in 2016. 
So that's now freely available as a PDF. You can buy the physical copy, I believe, still on the National Biodiversity Data Center for 20 euro or so. So if you want to buy the book, uh, if you like the PDF and you want a hard copy, buy the book. Um, we, uh, a couple of years ago, we did a red list. So the red list is basically where we look at each species and determine if it's uh, in decline or if it's healthy. Uh, we do this with National Parks and Wildlife. Um, and that's available as a free PDF. So if you just Google Stonefly Red List for Ireland, you'll get this top uh, this document in the top right hand corner um, and has some information if you're if you're interested. And then if you're really interested and you want to learn how to identify these uh, insects and you have a microscope, uh, the Freshwater Biological Association, so the new key we published last December is available, I think, for forty five pounds. Um, so uh, and it's a basically 500 pages of everything stonefly uh so it's 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 a really probably a niche niche thing but but um yeah there's lots of photographs and lots of information on each species in that and then just in terms of if you do have records and you don't know what to do so i suppose the first is get out to your local lake or or river or stream and and see what's there take photographs and collect the specimens so I often get asked, you know, should we be killing these? You know, it's, if it's only one or two, it's not the end of the world. There's literally each female will lay thousands of eggs every year. Um, so they, it's you're not going to dent the population or anything by collecting a few specimens. If you still don't want to kill them or anything, by all means, just take a photograph or collect the exuvae um, and they can be identified uh, if you'd prefer not to, to kill a couple of individuals. Um, again, you can log the record on the National Biodiversity Data Center and it will come to me. If there's a photograph, great, we can we can correct it or say yes or no to what you've identified it as. Um, but if you before that, if you want to even do that, you can always contact me on Twitter or X or whatever it's called. So there's my handle. Um, or there's a Facebook group called Insects Invertebrates of Ireland. So just Google Invertebrates of Ireland or not Google, um, search in Facebook and you can become a member of that and you literally post post a photograph and someone will tag me and I'll come in and tell you what it is um, if I can. Um, so generally, if you do that on Facebook, just post whatever date and location where you found it um, and someone will help you out. Um, and just acknowledgement. So I suppose I, I think the last time I gave a talk, so I forgot to thank all the people. So every year, um, lots of people submit records to the National Biodiversity Data Center. So if there's any of them here, just to say thanks, um, it's, it's much appreciated. Um, and also to thank the National Biodiversity Data Center for hosting all this uh, information. You know, they do it, they do a great job and they produce all the maps and, and, and they make all the data available. It's, it's, it's very easy. Um, and again, if you, anyone wants to contact me at any stage, I, you can do it on Twitter or you can email me at hughfeedy at gmail.com and I'll get back to you as soon as I can. Um, and I think that's me. So hopefully I wasn't too long. <laughs> I think I was just a little bit over the 40 minutes. No, Hugh, that was actually, that was wonderful. That was really, really interesting. Um, thank you so much for your time. Um, look, I forgot to say, if anybody has questions, if they can block them into the questions um, 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 section of um, Zoom. But I certainly have a question for you. If you, if you act, and also to point out, I actually do have a hard copy of your, um, of that nat of the National Biodiversity Stoneflies book. It's, um, it's much better than the PDF. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I, no, it was a beautiful production. It I is, yeah. They paid for the whole thing and they were very good um to do it and um, just in terms of what you've noticed in terms of um like um trends in populations of stonefly um like that you know while globally there tends to be a trend down trend downwards in terms of insect numbers um are you noticing that in ireland and also um is there any potential for new species because like we've seen i've you know we've heard of other um other insect groups like to say for example the emperor dragonfly where we've seen new species being added even though there's, there, there might be a downward trend there's new species being added but i suppose with stoneflies because of their um because of their um their 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 they don't they may not spread that far they may not be as much but what, what are you what are you seeing yeah no um first question is hard to know um so in my day-to-day -day job you know obviously when rivers decline if they do decline um because of pollution and stuff generally it's the mayfly stoneflies that are first to go um and like we have lots of records so there's records for example of like i when i trail back through some of the history work um and some of the so when we built the database originally we were able to find records of species in parts of say uh don't too specific but i know for example the play the strafen there on the liffey 
would have had multiple species of stonefly back in the 1930s when uh, one of the uh, ladies there was doing some research and none of those species occur there now. So that's, you know, so you do get these local extinctions, um, unfortunately, and, and they're probably not, we're not, they're probably more common than we know, but because we're not, there isn't enough people on the ground looking for them uh, or coming across them. Um, but again, you do get these occasional knockouts and you do, because the females have wings, they do get blown, they do fly, and they lay thousands of eggs. So often you might see them disappear for a year or two and then suddenly reappear if conditions get better. So it's not necessarily a death sentence if they do disappear. Um, in terms of, um, and, and just to mention then, obviously climate now is going to affect that because, and that's, something i i i'm i've been talking with colleagues in the uk and, and elsewhere in ireland about how we could start to look at that and it's not necessarily black and white there's it's probably one of these where we have to invest a lot of our own time over the next 10 15 years to even see a pattern if there's a pattern um and we we haven't tied down anything um in terms of new species, that's a good question because obviously we've seen like new dragonflies and so and 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 damsel and no damsels with dragonflies come in. Uh, potentially, I suppose. I I guess you can never say never. And, and interestingly, in the UK, in the south of the UK, um, I don't know my geography. Of the UK is not great now, but along the southern coast with France, uh, there's a new species, Numura lacrustris, uh, and they reckon it got blown in on on a on an easterly. Uh, and that inhabits the southern tip of the of Britain now, and it's they literally have only found it in the last five six years, um, and that's beginning to spread. Um, there's also the challenge now. So um, not challenge, but there's also uh, genetics is another area where there's, there's it's opening all sorts of interesting things, um, where we're we're building a data set of genetics for stonefly in Ireland. And the presumption is when we put this into the national, uh, the, the European data set or the British and Irish data set, that everything will match off. But there's quite, there, there could be a probability that one of them doesn't. Um, and like we had this with Mayfly a few years ago where we discovered Betis Atlanticus, where basically they put in the genetics. It didn't match the species they thought it was. They went back looking at it and found out, oh, this is actually different. But the thing was, every time someone identified it, they were using the same to they were using traits that were similar across two species and weren't really looking at it in much detail um so you know it's hard to you know so it's, you never know i guess is a long-winded way of saying maybe sorry we just have a few other questions there as well to you yeah. um, annika has one um yeah. do the adults breed at all generally i've often observed the yellow stoflies um Tripunctata on Irish Spurge, assuming they yeah. were taking nectar or pollen, but not sure. I see Annika, and I actually there's Annika's photograph in, in the last slide. Uh, her surname is different, but maybe that's um, <clears throat> maybe more Facebook than and reality uh, than life. Um, yes, they do. So uh, the Pelodidae and the Perlidae to be, um, and the Capnidae, I think, don't feed. Uh, whereas all the other, so Chloroperlidae, Numuridae, and Leuctridae, feed and they generally feed on pollen um they will feed on other things so there's a study done by Cormac McConaughey uh, formerly of UCD he's now in law pro and he looked at uh Leuctra inimus and basically he was looking at how uh, conifer plantations were affecting adults and he was able to give them willow pollen and uh, Sitka spruce pollen and every time they went for the willow pollen so there was kind of this well if you're planting Sitka spruce along a river perhaps you should have pollen there so that you know the insects have something to feed on them so you know they're yes they do and they can be quite specific and and i know annika has sent on photographs of of them on yellows uh, and irish spurge before so yeah they probably are feeding on that uh, proving it is a bit more difficult you probably just have to sit and watch them probably for for a while um and marion murphy um um as a nice little um, oh, yeah. comment that she is stoneflies in her Cork City pond. We'll send photos. So that's, uh, I, that's is nice that in the one. pond or the loch? Oh. <laughs> I, wouldn't, I wouldn't know if the stoneflies are in the loch. Now, but, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, please do. Like this is like these, the, the reason, half the reason I do these talks is, is kind of just to reach out to groups that have lots of photographs and lots of things that maybe are not necessarily, you know, hoarding them or nesting them. It's just, they don't know where to, what to do with them. So please do. Yeah. And Hannah Markham says, hi, Hugh. Very interesting oh, yeah. talk. Thank you. Um, are there any stonefly species that have evolved to be able to reduce by um, pathogenesis like some of the mayfly have? Yeah. So 
Zvichnia bifrons will reproduce by parthenogenesis. So for anyone who doesn't know, that basically means females can reproduce without males. Uh, so they can just... Um, so we had no direct evidence of it in Ireland, but the Capnidae, especially the, the group Zvich, the, the genus Zvichnia, I think there's quite a good bit of evidence to suggest that they are producing pathogenically. But I'd imagine they're all able to do it. You probably just need to be able to A, document it and build the right conditions. And again, a lot of this is probably done experimentally as opposed to in, in the wild. And that, you know, then you get into the whole behavioral side and is that really happening or not? But anyway, long story short is yes, they probably do. Okay. Um, um, Zlickney is also quite interesting in the sense that, um, so I'm going to get technical now. Most of them are, uh, will lay eggs and the eggs will spend a period of time before they hatch. Uh, the Capniidae, especially Zvichnia, again, the genus, they will often lay live young. So the eggs are hatching internally and they're laying live young. So that's called the, 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 the viv, uh, oviviviparity, I think, is the scientific term. I, I can't, or anyway, someone will correct me on that. I'll probably said it wrong, but um, yeah. So there, there are all these wonderful behavioral uh things that they'll do um, and they're not that different from any insect groups in that sense but they 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 will okay. um rachel says very interesting talk thank thank for going through all the facts and hannah has another um question do you know if much work has been done that you're aware of, of the gut content of the stonefly and any microplastic content um yes we have done some gut analysis uh i've done some myself um and there's uh, two comments on plastic they tend to be quite plastic in what they feed on being in they'll feed on generally anything so the term plastic beer being reflecting the variability now they do like to be specific if they can but if they can't be specific they'll be quite general um especially the herbivor herbivorous uh groups uh in terms of microplastic nothing comes to mind um but i guess a lot of the time these microplastic studies they tend to be done across communities where they look at multiple groups and multiple species so there probably is a stonefly group in there somewhere but um i couldn't tell you but i i, I would imagine if there's if there's microplastics in the river or the stream or the lake it'll be in the insects gut um you know we already see it in the caddisfly cases we're all we've seen it in in fish guts we've seen it so yeah probably yeah. highly likely okay. Uh, on that note, um, kind of depressing note, but anyway, but Hugh, thanks very much for that. That was very, very interesting. And um, thank you everyone for um, coming along and especially thank you, Hugh, for um, your wonderful talk tonight.